Hey, what's going on guys? So for today's video, I'm going to be going over all the stuff you need to know for Railjack. I'm going to be covering pretty much everything, so hopefully this video is going to be a one-stop shop for whatever kind of information you're looking for. Um, I'm going to start with the basics, and then I'm going to move on to you know what kind of builds you're looking to get, um, how to get the right avionics and parts for your Railjacks, as well as like where to farm, um, and a couple of things like that. I'm going to be covering like the damage the enemy types as well as uh, what drops and where. So hopefully if you're just starting with Railjack or you haven't gotten into it yet, this will help you get into it. And if you have done a good amount, then I'm hoping that this video at least tells you something new about Railjack in general. But because I am going to be covering a lot of things in this video, um, it is going to be fairly long, so I'll try to provide timestamps under the description. And before I get started, I just want to say I am not going to be complaining about Railjack. I mean, it's got a lot of problems, um, and I'm not trying to disguise that or, you know, uh, avoid that. But I'd much rather keep this video to actually being informational about Railjack itself instead of just complaining about what's wrong with it, as well as, like, going over things to fix. Alright, so first off, let's talk about how to actually queue up for Railjack. There are two different ways. The first way is to hit this little button in the navigation panel that says select a mission to join a crew. And what this means is you're going to be queuing up as a crew member and it's not going to be taking your ship. If you're on a party, this will kick you out of the party. So just know that going in. Um, it's basically just putting you into somebody else's ship and you're joining them for whatever mission you've selected. Now, the person whose ship it is is going to have control of that mission. And in order to have a ship, if you're not aware, you need to go to your dojo if you have one or if your clan has one and go to the dry dock which is a room you'll have to build in your dojo here you can then build your own railjack making your own railjack consists of building six different parts that each have a 12 hour build time the parts themselves cost 1 million credits a piece which might be a lot for new players and maybe you'll need to run the index or just wait until you're able to get enough credits to build the railjack yourself but for veterans the credit cost is probably not going to be that big of a deal what is going to be an initial hurdle is the new resources. So that's like the cubic diodes, the carbides, and the pustules, uh, as well as the copernics. And I think that's, yeah, that's it. The copernics are the last new resource. Um, I would suggest getting these resources in arcing missions. So queue up as a crew member, like I showed you before, and get them in the missions. You can farm them from Orb Valis and Plains of Eidolon, but those farms are terrible, so just don't do that. And queue up for a mission, and you should be getting the carbides and things very quickly. I do want to make sure people know that you don't actually have to build your own railjack to play the missions. All you need is an arc wing to queue up with another squad, like I showed you in the navigation menu. And speaking of the navigation menu, let's look at the star chart for railjack. Now, railjack takes you to a different type of star chart with Proxima planets, or in the Vale's case, it's just like a void area. And this works just like a regular star chart, so you'll have to progress one node at a time. However, it does lock you out of the higher level nodes by requiring you to have a certain level of an intrinsic. So for Saturn, you're going to need level 3 intrinsics, and for Veil, vale, you're going to need level 7 intrinsic. Now, your intrinsic level only has to be in one of the four schools or skill trees. Tactical, piloting, gunnery, or engineering. Now, you can obviously max all these out. As you can see here, I have level 10 in all of them. And I think some people think that, like, you max one school, which I think is partly D's fault. They kind of alluded to the fact that you would be like, you know, playing the engineer role or something, or you would be the playing the pilot role. And there is a little bit of that in missions, but I think that largely um, that's just a byproduct of them not testing out the Railjack missions too much initially. Because really you can do everything, and if you're not helping out with multiple different things, typically you're not doing a very good job of being a squad mate in Railjack. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later. But right now, let's talk about each of the intrinsic schools and what they actually do. So if you guys aren't aware, intrinsics is an affinity-based progress, which means that it's very similar to focus, although there is not a daily cap. This means that having an affinity booster is highly recommended when playing Railjack missions. That way you're getting the most experience or intrinsics out of each mission. And if you're like me and you kept an affinity booster up for every single mission, then you basically completed intrinsics twice as fast as someone without a booster would. And if you're in it for the mastery points, then this is what you want to focus on because each of these ranks is going to give you 1,500 mastery points for a total of 60,000 mastery rank experience for all four. All right, here's where I'm going to settle in and talk about each of these intrinsics and their abilities. 
Let's start with Tactical. So the first rank of Tactical, Tactical System, allows you to open the Tactical menu, which you can bring up by hitting L while in your Railjack. Now, I'm not sure what the controls are on console, so I'm just going to be talking about PC controls here. I do apologize for my console users out there. But this screen will allow you to deploy any Tactical Avionics that the person has equipped on the ship, whether that's you or somebody else. It also allows you to track your crew and see what they're doing on the ship, as well as place waypoints by pressing right mouse button on the location. The second ability, Ability Kinesis, allows you to use your Warframe abilities as tactical support while you're on the Railjack. This means that depending on what Warframe you have equipped, you're able to cast one of your Warframe's abilities on the Railjack itself. These abilities use Flux Energy, and honestly, they're pretty terrible overall. Um, I haven't really seen too many meta strats with it, so, you know, some are good, like Wukong, some are just whatever, like Rhino. If you want to see a full list of these abilities, then I'll leave a link below in the description. The third ability, Command Link, allows you to teleport around the ship by using the tactical menu. This is really good if you're in the back of the ship and you need to go to the front really quickly, or vice versa, or if you just want to go into the slingshot. Uh, there's lots of different uses here, but the main thing is that you're just able to go wherever you need to go at the current moment. Unfortunately, it does mean that you have to bring up the tactical menu, which honestly, in my opinion, is kind of a crappy menu, but that's just me. Recall Warp is one of the best abilities in Railjack, and that's because it allows you to use the Omni tool outside of the Railjack to teleport back into it. And I use this all the time because it's just really, really good for going back to the ship when you need to. Overseer will allow you to see other players using the tactical menu, and you can basically see the game from their perspective. Um, this isn't really that useful. Sometimes it's funny to spectate somebody who's bugged, but other than that, it's not really that great. Tactical efficiency, on the other hand, is really good because it lowers your flux energy consumption by 25%, and if you're using a lot of battle avionics, which I do in my build because Munitions Vortex is super good, and I'll talk about that later, but you want to have this just for the efficiency to cast your abilities more, which should hopefully make sense and sound familiar with other Warframe builds. Tactical response is pretty straightforward. It will reduce your tactical avionics cooldowns by 20%, which um, I don't really think it's ever worth using tactical avionics, but if you are, then this will help out with that. Which brings us to the rank 8 skill. Now, if you are just trying to get as much value for your intrinsics as possible, then stop at rank 8 on every single tree. They're the best abilities by far. The rank 10s, you might think that they would be good, but currently they're not. And I think DE's gotten a lot of feedback about that, so maybe they'll change at some point. Like everything else in this video, um, most of Railjack content seems pretty placeholder, so it could change over time and expect it to. But the rank 8 here will reduce your Arcwing tactical blink, which is bound to your roll button on the Arcwing. So on PC, that's tapping shift while you're already sprinting will allow you to blink forward. And I use this all the time. You're able to rebind it to a different key, which I would recommend if you are going to be using blink a lot because it makes it so much easier on your hands. This will also apply outside of Railjack missions, so if you're doing a lot of Eidolons and you want to blink with your Arcwing, then you want to pick this up. The Rank 9 ability, again, reduces the Tactical Avionic cooldown by 20%, which, as I mentioned before, Tactical Avionics are generally pretty useless currently, so you're not really using them that much, and the Rank 9 here is not very valuable. The Rank 10 on this tree is Join Warp, which is one of the better Rank 10s. It allows you to teleport from your location to the target crew member's location after 5 seconds. This can take you anywhere. Honestly, I don't really use it that much because I don't like opening the tactical menu, but you can obviously use it to good effect if you're teleporting to somebody inside a dock or something like that and then help them out from there. It's nice, just not a super exciting ability. Anyways, let's move on to piloting. So the first ability in piloting allows you to basically sprint with your ship. It's boost. You know, hold uh, your left shift button and you'll uh, boost for a short time. Vector Maneuver is a directional burst, so this allows you to burst in one direction or the other if you're tapping shift or sprint or whatever you have bound to. Vector Evasion allows you to disjoint enemy projectiles when you use the Vector Maneuver. Um, I don't really notice this in gameplay, but I assume it happens. Um, not really the most important thing, but it's good, you know, assuming that it works properly. Safe Flight's kind of the same thing, it just reduces damage by 50% from collisions, which I'm assuming works properly, but I'm not sure if it's just for the Railjack or if it's for Railjack and Arcwing. Drift Maneuver is basically another uh, sprint ability, it allows you to hit your sprint button again to basically enable a second level of boost, which will charge up and upon release will propel you in the direction that you're facing. 
which can be a huge amount. You know, you can get like thousands and thousands of meters per drift. And if you've seen people jump forward with the Railjack, that's what this is. It's just basically a way to teleport the Railjack forward by charging up your boost. Slipstream is pretty self-explanatory. It just increases boost time by 25%. Enhanced Maneuvers is also pretty self-explanatory. It just causes Vector and Drift Maneuvers to consume 25% less boost, which means that you have more boost overall. Again, with the rank 8 Aeronaut, if you're going to stop anywhere, stop here and just get the Arc Ring Speed, which again applies outside of the Railjack missions. Evasion... Reduces incoming damage by 10% while boosting, not useful at all. Ramming speed is actually pretty good because with particle ram you can deal extra damage to enemies if you ram into them. So this deals 2000 particle damage to the enemy when you hit them while boosting, which you should always be boosting. The piloting tree is pretty self-explanatory, I think overall it just allows you to pilot better. Um, I would definitely recommend picking these up, especially at the higher level because you want to be able to move around very quickly and this allows you to do that. Gunnery is a tree is kind of okay. It starts out with target sync, which is pretty nice. It just allows you to aim with the lead indicator, which is the little dot you see on the screen. So if you shoot at that dot, typically your projectiles are going to hit. So it just allows you to lead the projectiles properly, and there's a little indicator in game for it. Phantom Eye is one of the best abilities in here, although I don't really get very much use out of it. It allows you to see a 360 degree angle while in a side gun, which is very, very important because it lets you see so much more than you would normally. I don't even remember what it's like to not have this and it's just really useful. You should pick it up. The arc ring slingshot's kind of okay. Um, honestly, I find it a little awkward to use most times, but if you're able to use it properly, it'll send you right into a cruise ship or it'll blow up a fighter if you hit them directly. Although most times if you're killing a cruise ship, you're probably going into it with an arc wing instead of using the slingshot because the slingshot depends on the pilot and it's just more awkward to use. It's more limiting. It's similar to the front artillery because it just requires the proper aim with the pilot and coordination between you and them. Arcing Warheads, what I was just talking about, where it allows you to go through the hull of the cruise ships with the slingshot, which just lets you basically land on the cruise ship without getting into arcing and then entering normally. Artillery Command is the front artillery I was just talking about. It's the one that allows you to shoot at cruise ships and it's supposed to kill them, but right now, uh, especially at the higher levels, it doesn't really do it. Um, it's not that great of an ability as it is currently, but you know, I pick it up anyways because getting through to the next couple abilities is important. And that's because cold trigger reduces heat accretion on your turrets which is super important because it'll allow you to shoot more. And Advanced Gunnery also does a similar thing where it reduces the overheat recovery time by 50%, which means that you're able to fire again faster. Uh, it also extends the slingshot range by 50%, but again, that's not really that important. Vengeful Arcwing. Now this is one of the best intrinsics, if not the best intrinsic, because it allows you to get extra ability strength and efficiency with your Arcwing which means if you're using a Misha, this will cap out your total efficiency. The strength and the ability range are nice here, but it's really all about that efficiency, and the damage is not really worth talking about. Combat Drift increases your damage while reducing your heat buildup while you're drifting, although it's not really that useful because if you're drifting, it's really hard to hit things, so this is just kind of a crappy skill. Um, the rank 10 skill, Reflex Aim, is okay. It'll snap your aim to the target for 0.5 seconds, which is, it's all right, but it's not really that good especially for someone like me who almost never aims down my scope at the target. But it depends on what weapons you're using and it's kind of personal preference whether or not you want to pick this up. Just know that it only lasts for 0.5 seconds and your normal aim will reset after that. And last but not least, the engineering tree, which starts out with Applied Omni, which increases the speed at which you repair hazards. The Flux Forge is really important because it allows you to craft Flux Energy, so if you're using Flux Energy in the mission, which is basically like your Battle Avionics, your Tactical Avionics, or if you're using Warframe abilities, this will allow you to craft more of that. The Ordnance Forge, same thing, it just allows you to craft more Ordnance at the Forge. The Optimization Pass increases your Forge Yields, which basically just means that it increases the amount of consumables that you can get per craft. Because once you've activated the forge for a craft, you have to wait until the forge has finished before restarting it again. Although you get the crafting materials immediately upon crafting them in the forge. There's just a cooldown period. Dome charge forge, again, pretty simple. It just allows you to craft dome charges in the forge. 
Forge Accelerator increases the processing speed by 25%, which basically just means that it takes two minutes and 15 seconds for the Forge to reset now, once you have this unlocked. Full Optimization is just another Forge Yields ability, which increases the total yield to plus 50% on whatever you're crafting. The Vigilant Arcwing skill here it increases the health shields and armor of your Arcwing. It won't you know, prevent you from getting one shot though, so don't take this as a must have. It's just something that it's nice to get once you have it. The surplus yield will increase your refinement gains by 10%, which is fine, I guess, after a certain point, especially by the time you get this unlocked, you probably won't care about refinement so much. Um, but, you know, if other people in your group need it, then it is nice to get 10% extra mats from refinement. And the last ability here is Anastasis, which allows you to remotely repair hazards on board. So that's like fires, hull breaches, etc. Um, using this will cost twice as much Revelite compared to if you're doing it with your Warframe, but you can do it from anywhere, which is really helpful if you're out doing something else and you just want to repair a hazard really quickly, such as a catastrophic failure if you're not near the area, but you do have to be on the ship to use this. The way that I leveled these up was I went all level one, two, three, four, five, and then I got one of these to level seven because every time they double in cost, so the higher you go, the more they cost, meaning that getting all of them to level five only costs 124, but getting the last two levels and one of them to level seven is gonna cost you an additional 96 intrinsics. And I think it's just important to have some of the basic abilities unlocked when you're playing Railjack. Although obviously it's up to you. Um, once you get to rank seven in one of them, I would then go to rank eight in all of them and then finish it out with the rank nine, rank tens. But overall the rank nine, rank tens are not as necessary as some of the lower abilities, which is fairly counterintuitive and maybe not the best way to design this, but it is how it is. I realized that was kind of long, but I wanted to cover these. Um, so if you guys have any questions about them, please leave a comment below. Or if I miss something like a bug or something you want people to know about, it's currently in the game, leave it in the comments. Now that we've talked about the intrinsics, let's take a look at the Railjack missions themselves to understand what we need to actually accomplish in each mission. Because I've had people who queue for the Railjack missions and they don't seem to understand what the current objectives are or how to accomplish them well. So let's cover that. Every mission is going to be basically the same thing, where you have a certain number of fighters and cruise ships to kill. Now I think this is mostly a product of the game shipping out Railjack a little too soon and there not being a diverse number of mission types, but right now it's what we have so you know you just gotta deal with it. Earth's gonna have 30 fighters, 2 cruise ships, Saturn's gonna have 60 fighters, 4 cruise ships, and Vale's going to have 90 fighters and 6 cruise ships. I hope you noticed the very subtle way they scaled Railjack missions in the game. And while we're on the subject of scaling, let's talk about the enemies in Railjack, because they're different than enemies in the normal game. For one thing, the fighters are going to take 95% less damage from their arc guns than other enemies in the game will. And that's why guns that are able to proc the particle status, which is the exponential multiplier, are very good for Railjack. And that's things like the Syngus, the Imperator Vandal, and the Phaedra. Although right now the Syngus is by far the best, in my opinion. And if you're wondering about the damage types as well as what statuses they cause, uh, this is it. So the Slash is basically particle damage, Impact is ballistic damage, Puncture is plasma damage, and then Heat is incendiary damage, Electricity is ionic damage, Toxin is chem damage, and cold is frost damage. The important things here are slash, puncture, and to a lesser extent, cold. Everything else is not worth caring about. And if you have combined damages on your art gun, like radiation, for instance, those will not proc a status on the enemies, which means that having combined elements will actually increase the proc chance of someone like slash, which is particle damage. Are you confused yet? Because you should be. I don't know who the heck designed this, but Jesus Christ. Basically what you need to know, if you're wondering, is you want to be building for heavy slash with status, and then maybe have some puncture on there for the plasma procs, which are basically corrosive procs, or cold procs, which will slow down the enemy ships, and it's very useful for killing them. If you're curious about the damage types, I'll leave a link in the description below, I'm not going to be covering them in total here, but I covered the ones I thought were important. Anyways, when queuing up for the Railjack missions, you might notice that the fighter levels are kind of low. It'll start out at level 1 to 3, and it'll go up to like level 30 or 40. Even though they're fairly low in terms of high level missions in Warframe, the fighters and cruise ships will be very, very tanky by the end, especially because, again, you deal 95% less damage with arc guns. 
Now what you might refer to as the regular enemies, which are like the Grenier and other ground units, are going to be much tankier than they are in the rest of the game. And that's because they have extra armor and extra health. Which you can see here on the Exo Butcher compared to the Corrupted Butcher. So a Corrupted Butcher has 5 base armor and 100 base health. Whereas the Exo Butcher will have 200 base armor and 750 base health. And that'll get even higher with levels. So by the end of the Railjack Star Chart, you're dealing with like level 80 plus enemies. All that's to say that you want to bring something that can deal high damage because you're really going to need it if you're trying to kill the enemies. Although overall, I don't think killing the ground units is that important for Railjack missions in total. It is possible to stealth farm some extra intrinsics from ground units, although I don't really think that's worth it for your time, especially now that you lose all intrinsics upon aborting a mission without completing the objective. Which brings me to the objectives. Every mission you have to kill the fighters and the cruise ships, that's a guaranteed for every Railjack mission. Which means that if you're trying to help out your team, you want to be taking care of the fighters and the cruise ships. Now, sometimes you can get additional objectives like kill a commander or destroy a missile platform. You'll need to complete the secondary objectives to get rewarded for the mission. Which means that a lot of times it's actually more beneficial for you to complete the secondary objectives well one or two people in your team are killing the cruise ships and or fighters. Like for me personally, I can kill every fighter in the mission very easily and very quickly by myself. So having a teammate that takes out either the cruise ships or deals with the secondary objective is way more important than having someone who sits in a side turret and tries to clean up whatever I miss. I can't tell you the number of times where I've had a teammate just sit in the side turret the entire mission and I've killed all the fighters and I've also killed all the cruise ships by myself. It is nice to have someone sit back and help prepare the ship if you need that. Um, a lot of times it's not that necessary, especially if you have a decent ship and you can just repair the catastrophic breach and then continue on with the mission without really worrying about the borders very much. All I'm trying to say here is that pay attention to what you can help the team with. You know, the objectives are what matters. You're not doing a capture mission and then killing every single enemy up to the capture target, you know? You just want to finish the mission as fast as possible to get the rewards at the end, which are going to be the Railjack parts that you want. It's pretty hard for most Railjacks to actually die, especially if you've gotten some of the better avionics, which I'll talk about in a second. But worst case scenario, if your Railjack's having a hard time surviving, just park it near an asteroid, you know? You don't actually have to be in the Railjack at all times, and oftentimes, being outside in an arc wing or doing something else in the mission is far more beneficial to your team than sitting inside the Railjack waiting for things to happen to you. Don't be that teammate who sits around the Railjack the entire time waiting for something to happen. Anyways, let's talk about where you actually get your avionics and parts from. All the avionics are going to come from the Railjack fighter drops. The fighters are Cutters, Tactuses, Flax, and Outriders. Now, there's non-elite and elite versions of all of them. The Earth versions of these enemies are called Cosima. The Saturn versions of these enemies are called Gyre and the Veil versions of these enemies are called Exo. So basically there's not only an elite versions and then there's one class per planet. And when you're looking to get the avionics from these enemies, you want to be going for the Zetki avionics because the Zetkis are usually the best. There's some cases where uh, the Lavins or the Vidars are better, but mostly the Zetkis are the good ones. And you can tell them apart by the symbols on the outside of the avionics. So the circles are Lavin, the triangles are Vidar, and the rectangles are Zetki. So just look for rectangles and you'll know that you got a good mod drop. Now at this point you might be wondering what my avionics build is for my Railjack. So for my Railjack build, I have three goals in mind. One, be tanky. Two, deal damage. And three, be fast. You want to be fast to move from one pack to the next, because if you're using Munition Vortex to kill the enemies, you're going to want to have speed in order to catch up to the enemies in time for them to not move too far away from each other. Now to accomplish this, I have Zetki Bulkhead, which is the best bulkhead you can get. Zetki Hoey, which is the best Hoey you can get. These give me tankiness on my Railjack, and I don't really think I need too much more than just these mods. As for damage, I'm running Zetki Hyperstrike with both Predator and Section Density. Predator gives a crit chance, and Section Density gives crit damage. Now, the crits don't actually translate onto the Munition Vortex, but it helps out with if I'm trying to clean up the enemies or on the side guns. I definitely recommend running these for the extra damage if you're not using Munition Vortex, or if you run out of Flux Energy. They're very, very good. 
Currently, the Vidar Predator is the highest crit chance, although I think that might have been a mistake after the most recent patch, so Zetki might go back to being the best. I also have Zetki Polar Coil here, and that's just to increase my turret heat capacity, so I'm able to fire roughly 66% more than I would normally with my turrets. And you can see that on the left-hand side, where it says heat capacity on my turret. So I have 1,660 heat capacity. As for my speed, I'm running Conic Nozzle, which is the increase to the base speed, and I have Ion Burn as well, which is the increase to the boost speed. Um, currently, I'm running the Lavin versions of Ion Burn and the Lavin version of Conic Nozzle, which are the two that provide the highest bonus. Now, for all of these avionics, you can run the lower versions if you don't have the capacity, or run a slightly different variation on the avionics if you need to. Like, I think early on, running Void Cloak for survivability is really nice, although later on it decreases your speed, which is not what you want. So having a lower end build and then a higher end build could be good, but in this case I'm showing a higher end build. And then the last avionic you'll see here, which you notice I didn't talk about, is forward artillery. Now I said the forward artillery is not very good earlier, and I do agree with that, but if you run this Zetki version with the 93% increased damage, and you also apply particle status, or you remove some of the enemy ship's armor, it is able to kill the cruise ships. But it is a little more niche, so I, I do I do want to make it clear that it is a little more difficult to pull off than, you know, you just get in your turret and you fire. If I were to add a different avionic to this, it would probably be Hyperflux for the extra flux capacity. Overall, your flux capacity is probably going to be enough, but if you do want some extra flux, then you can use Hyperflux. But I think overall your integrated build is going to look very similar to this in most cases. Now I mentioned before that I don't like using tactical avionics and I just don't think that any of these are worth using due to their cooldown and also their effects. Um, the only one that's arguable again is Void Cloak for the invisibility. Most other things are just not worth the cost for what their effect is. As for my battle avionics, here I have Munitions Vortex which is the best avionic in the game. You should absolutely have Munitions Vortex in every build you are using with Railjack, assuming that you know you have access to it. It is fairly rare, it costs about I think 60 platinum currently on PC. And then the other one I have here is Particle Ram. Particle Ram is good because it allows you to clean up ships if you don't kill them in one hit with Mutant Vortex or if you just need an extra little bit of damage after firing at them, which also pairs well with the rank 10 piloting intrinsic. Again, you have to hit the enemies for that to apply, but this will add an extra 1500 damage to them. I realize a lot of people like Void Hole, but it's not really that good. It costs four times the amount that Mutant Vortex does, and it doesn't deal nearly as much damage. So if you're asking me why don't you have Void Hole on your build, even though you have it, it's because I don't think it's worth using. Um, in a lot of cases, it's just too awkward, and other times it doesn't deal near enough damage or put you in a position to actually kill the enemies, which is what Mutant Vortex does, and that's what you want. Void Hole does look really cool, though. As for the rest of the battle avionics, none of them are worth using, so just don't worry about them too much. Um, if you don't have access to the ones that I mentioned here, the only other one I would suggest possibly using is Seeker Volley for damage, and Fiery Phoenix possibly for extra speed, although I don't particularly enjoy that. It drains Flux Energy too fast, and most cases it's not really helping that much. While we're talking about avionics here, I want to talk about the grid, which, I mean, I don't really understand why this exists, but... It basically allows you to upgrade each slot to increase the rank of whatever equipped avionic you have in that slot by three. So it's basically like adding three free levels to whatever avionics you have. And early on, you want to be increasing the grid capacity instead of upgrading your avionics because it doesn't actually cost additional avionics capacity when you increase the levels via the grid versus leveling the avionics, which does cost capacity. And early on, if you've played any Railjack, I'm sure you'll run into avionics capacity issues. And all in all, it only costs 40,000 direct to level up every single slot here. And as you can see on the left-hand side here, I have over 400,000 direct, which I'll never end up using. Um, it's basically space endo, guys. Direct is space endo. It's the same thing in space, just like avionics are mods, but for space. So hopefully my logic there makes sense and you understand how I built my Railjack's avionics. Obviously, this is a completed build and I have access to every single avionic, so it might look different than yours if you don't have access to some of these avionics, but it is good to work towards them and or fill in lower rank versions of the same avionic that I have here. Next, let's talk about the Railjack components, which are the shield, the engine, and the reactor. The most important part here is going to be your reactor, 
And if you've spent any time in Railjack, you'll know that lots of people are looking for the Vidar reactors, and that's because they have the highest avionics capacity at 100. The highest avionics you can get on Lavin reactors are 90, and the highest you can get on Zetki reactors are 80. Now, they each have varying levels of flux capacity and avionics, depending on which version you get, but the one you really want, again, are the Vidar, just because avionics capacity is king. Flux capacity is kind of trash. And you may notice from looking at this, the Mark III parts have secondary effects on them, so my Vidar reactor has Tenno's gain a 50% speed boost for five seconds when deploying their arc wing. Overall, the secondary effects aren't the most important thing. You want to go for the primary stats first, but you can get better ones. Like down here, you can see I have one that has gain immunity for twice as long after a major breach is repaired, which I would like to have over the speed boost, but it doesn't really matter that much because the speed boost has a higher capacity. Engines are kind of the same thing where you want to be going for the kilometers per hour roll over the boost speed multiplier roll because the boost speed multiplier doesn't really add that much. So the best engines are VIDAR engines, which can max out at 60 kilometers per hour. The one I have is only 55, but it's still pretty good. Um, I do have very good Lavin engines at uh, 30, 60 almost, which is going to be the max. And I have Zetki engines at 39, 29, which are close to max again at 40 and 30 respectively. Um, again, the secondary bonus here is just, you know, icing on the cake. It's not something you want to be directly going for. You know, the primary stats are usually the best, but if you get a decent secondary roll, then that's nice to have. And then last and definitely least are the shields. On Railjack, as with most gameplay, shields aren't very good for effective health, mostly because they're not affected by armor. But here, uh, I'm going for shield regen delay as well as shield regeneration per second. And the Zetki ones have the best ones for that. You know, what you choose here is really up to you. I think there's some potential for some of these other roles, uh, especially with the secondary, depending on how you want to play. But overall, I think you just want the extra regen speed and regen delay. Because having your shields up will help prevent breaches and other status effects on your ship. But they're not really the best in terms of effective health. Now, you might be asking me, where do you get these parts? Okay, so the Zetki parts as well as the weapons drop from the Elite Exo Outriders in the Veil. Um, you only want to be going for the Mark III parts if possible. I would try to just, you know, shoehorn yourself into the Veil and then use the Veil to get better parts for your ship. Instead of going like Mark I, Mark II, Mark III, you want to just go straight from the Sigma parts, which if you can get them from your clan, you'll want to build those first and then transition into the Mark III parts you see here. The Zetki parts and weapons are the most common to get because they drop from the Elite Exo Outriders. There's a guaranteed drop every single time an Elite Outrider that they'll drop a Zetki part. And the Lavin and Vidar parts are a 4% drop chance after every mission completion. Which means you want to be completing the missions as fast as possible to try to get the high roll Vidar reactor. Which is going to be your biggest upgrade on your ship, hands down. And again guys, I'm not saying this is a good system, it just is what it is. As for the Lavin and Vidar weapons, they drop from cruise ships and don't have as high a drop chance as the Zetki parts do, because the Zetkis are guaranteed and the Vidar Lavins are not. But if you play enough, you'll definitely get the drops uh, eventually. If not, the highest rolls, you'll get good enough ones. Um, as you can see here, I have every single weapon built and they're close to max rolls. Which if you're wondering what I mean by max rolls, you can see at the top of the weapons, there is a random stat. So on some, there's fire rate, and then on some, there's weapon damage. Um, these are definitely not the most inventive random stats, and they're guaranteed on whichever type of weapon you have. So like a Lavin APOC will always have fire rate, and a Zetki Fotor will always have weapon damage. So over time, you can progressively get better and better ones, and I suggest only building them once they're a couple percent off of maximum, because the resources are fairly expensive and building more than honestly one or two weapons ever is not that important. Because as you can see in the armament screen, you only have slots for primary weapons, which are the pilot weapons, and then secondary weapons, which are the side weapons. And then you also have ordnance with the Tycho Seekers or whatever else you choose to put here. Although I don't really use the ordnance that much. I mostly focus on my primary weapons. Which brings me to the resource costs. 
it's important to know going in that the resource costs are very substantial considering how much of them you want to use at a time. This is most commonly a problem with titanium because after you play for a while, you should have a lot of the other resources, especially if you're running a resource booster, which I would recommend initially at least, just to get you over the hurdle of having three parts in your components and two weapons, because that's all you really need to have a railjack that works properly. And it can take a little bit of time, at least initially. So queuing up on someone else's squad and helping out that way instead of taking your own railjack into the mission can be beneficial. Because at this point, people should have fairly well-built railjacks and they'll allow you to at least get a good head start on your own. But I really don't want to understate the resource costs here. Just be very conservative initially and then later on you should have plenty where you're able to build whatever part or weapon you want. And as for weapons, you can see that I'm using the Zetki versions, which have a higher heat accretion, which basically means that they overheat faster, but they deal more damage. Um, if you want to use a different part, then you can. The Zetki ones are easy to get, and I'm using the, the Zetki Carcinox and the Zetki Apoc simply because they have the highest DPS for Munition Vortex, which is again what I'm using to kill the enemies. So when you're using Mission Vortex, you shoot out a projectile that creates a vortex which sucks in all other projectiles. This then accumulates damage up to, I assume, an infinite level, which can then be detonated and blow up for the accumulated damage. So that means that the higher DPS weapon you have against the Vortex, the faster you accumulate enough damage to kill the enemies in the surrounding area, which is the reason why I'm using the Zetki parts here. I know a lot of people enjoy using the Cryophons, and you can certainly do that, but I would probably also use the Zetki version of that because it's got a higher fire rate than the Vidar version. Even though the Vidar damage will have more damage per shot, if you have an over 50% weapon damage roll on the Vidar Cryophon. Ultimately, I would say that the weapons you use is mostly up to you, although I would recommend trying out these because they're the ones that I enjoy the most. But if you don't have the extra heat accretion mod on your Railjack, then possibly like the Vidar or the Lavins might feel better. Just play around with it and test it out for yourself, but I just wanted to suggest these two because I know the resource costs for all the weapons can be pretty substantial. But let's take a look at the actual gameplay. So what I'm doing with my Railjack is I'm using Munish Vortex to kill the enemies before they have a chance to attack me. Now, in Warframe, most times it's just about killing the enemies before they can kill you. Because if they're dead, they can't hurt you, right? So, with Vortex, you try to position next to the enemy spawns as soon as they spawn, which allows you to take them out immediately. So as you can see here, you delete an entire pack of enemies with one burst of Vortex. So by using Vortex, you can kill all the fighters in a mission very easily, and I would suggest picking up a copy of this avionic if you can. It works just like Novus 2, so once you cast it, you shoot into it to increase the damage it deals, and then detonate it by pressing the button again. It will detonate by itself over time, although it's usually better to activate it immediately so that you can kill an entire pack together. And it's worth noting that crits and damage types don't affect the overall damage of the ability. Also know going in that it says it deals damage in a 150 meter radius, but that radius is not accurate as with all the other avionics. The radius that is listed on the avionic itself is typically inaccurate. But by using this avionic, you're able to kill all the fighters in the mission by yourself as the pilot, which will allow your other teammates to then kill the cruise ships. And if you're doing Geon Point in the Veil, which is going to be the mission you want to do because it's basically just an exterminate mission and you care about the end of mission rewards, that 4% chance at the Vidar parts. So if you're trying to be efficient with your farm, then I would suggest running Geon Point for all your stuff once you've unlocked you know, all the nodes and done whatever you need to do. The other battle avionic I'm using here is Particle Ram. Particle Ram is basically a ram that attaches to the front of the ship. You can use it twice to cast it out in front of you, but I would suggest just keeping it on the ship permanently by casting it a single time. There's no drain associated with it, so it's just an initial cost. I use the ram to clean up the extra ships, assuming that I don't kill them all in one burst, or I use it to destroy titanium nodes and other nodes on the map that'll help me get resources, which is really good if you're farming earth. You can just use particle ram to kill all the ships, as well as gain all the titanium from the nodes. So if you're farming for parts in Railjack, this is typically what it's going to look like, assuming you have a completed build. If your build's not complete, then I would suggest just running an Arcwing with Amisha as well as a Singus, and I have a video covering that, which I'll link to below. They have changed the exponential damage buff from particle damage since I made that video, although all the information is still accurate as for what you want to build for. It's just your time to kill is going to be longer now than it was before. 
but overall I would say Arcwing is more efficient if you don't have a good battle avionics such as Munitions Vortex or, to a lesser extent, Void Hole. Although Void Hole really isn't that good in comparison. It costs four times the amount and it doesn't deal nearly enough damage. And while Munitions Vortex is fairly cheap in terms of flux energy, uh, I do run out sometimes so building it in the forge will need to happen occasionally. But if you build just like 200 flux energy every time you run out, then it should last you quite a long time considering it only costs 25 flux at base and then there's other reductions on that from intrinsics. But assuming your team's helping you out and killing the cruise ships while you're killing the fighters, most missions don't take more than 5 minutes, which is the most efficient farm for Railjack. Anyways guys, I hope this video helped you understand what you should be building for in Railjack, how to get there, as well as which parts drop from wire. I understand that I'm showing a completed build here, but I felt like that was the best way to show Railjack gameplay instead of showing different progression. Um, if you have any questions or if I missed something, which I'm sure I did because this is a 40 minute video and there's even more to talk about with Railjack in terms of like nuances with builds, but I'm hoping you at least gained an understanding of how the system works as well as what you should be working towards in your own gameplay. Anyways guys, that's going to do it for me. Hope you all have a good one and I'll see you later.